Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Next Thursday, we'll hear from Vicky Schreiner. She will tell us how to make sure that your app works with other apps. And in, in general, she's on a quest to make all apps talk to all apps. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Bing, Bill Anklam. He used to be with Agilent and now he's with Keysight Technologies. And he's going to talk to us about the elegance and the romance of signal processing. But before he begins, Ms. Morel, who is Ms. Morel? Is Ms. Morel here? Well, she was going to tell you something about the computer cloud. So we'll, we'll see what she has. Yeah. For the computer cloud, there might be that we're doing. Or oh, the resume thing. Oh, also the uh, we are doing marketing as well. I'm not sure. If Do you know what 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 times or days or? I believe the Keysight tour was on the 14th. Okay. Well, anyway, she's not here to confirm it. Let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, George. Um, so yes, I'm Bill Lanklum, and I'm now with Keysight Technologies, um, which was formerly Agilent, which was formerly HP. So my desk has been in the same place for the last 30 years, but I've worked for three different companies now. So we're going to, uh, as introduced, I'm going to talk about the value and elegance of digital signal processing. So let's dive right in. My simplistic definition of signal processing is basically the mathematical manipulation of sampled signal data. So let's parse that definition a little bit. Let's start with sampled signal data. It's basically a sequence of discrete and quantized values, which is sampled on some domain. It's a domain of your choice, whether it's time, frequency, space even, or a spatial frequency. So all those play. Now part of the mathematical manipulations where you are involved with and doing processing involve domain transformations. That's the heart and soul of signal processing in a lot of cases. In this case, is we're transforming from time to frequency and back. But there are additional, as I said, other domain transformations that get involved as well, depending on what realm you're working in. We also do lots and lots of filtering, which is basically taking one function, applying it to another to get a desired result out. So that's key to what we do as well. And finally, we're always resampling. Because generally, we're working between very two different domains. One is our analog world, which we interface to with data converters, either analog, analog to digital or digital analog. Those run at some generally very high rate. But then the other rate we're generally interested in is the, is the natural rate of the process we're measuring. And so we have to be able to trans, transform between those. And that, we do that through resampling. Let's jump in a little bit about elegance. So, because elegance and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, for a mathematician and a physicist like myself, beauty involves symmetry, as well as the analytical and visual power of the mathematics it's, that I'm using at the particular time. In this case, it's the complex plane, which we'll be talking about a lot here in this talk. And then finally, just the compactness of the equations we're involved in using. And here, this is Maxwell's equation. And this Four set of equations describes all the classical electrodynamics. Okay, very compact, very powerful. Now, value. Again, value has a lot of attributes, um, but the, the value the DSP brings to the game is its practical usefulness for the things we use in everyday life. For example, the dishwasher in your kitchen has DSP in it, surprisingly. Your iPhone, if you have one in your pocket, as well as the instruments that. Um, we, we create and design at Agile, no, excuse me, Keysight. Um, so let's give an even more specific example. I assume a lot of people in this room might have iPads. Well, that iPad has a, a very powerful, actually has a number of powerful CPUs as well as graphical processing units, all of which contribute to creating an immersive and visual environment in which you can play games on, in this case World of Warcraft. However, you know, playing by yourself at the, with, against the computer is rather isolationist. So how do you play with a friend? 
Well, you need to get connected. And you generally do that through either the LTE system, well, the cellular systems, or a Wi-Fi system, or a hardwired land, which is very archaic these days. And additionally, and this is one thing they haven't done yet, is you know one one things our one of the things our doctors were, tell us about is we need to get out and exercise more. Well, what if your character only moved if you moved? Well, how do you track that? You track it through GPS. So your your position and velocity could be tracked via the iPad, which would move as you move, your character moves. So all these things involve signal processing in different ways, shapes, and form. So where does that magic occur? Well, this is an iPhone 5, which is now dated. And it, it incorporates, as I mentioned before, a couple of CPUs and some very powerful GPUs in it. But it also includes all the communication gear that's required to talk to you know, the world outside of itself. But that it doesn't end there. It also includes gyroscopes you know, in terms of tilt and motion, audio codecs, and even the power management units on these, on these systems are very sophisticated and have a lot of signal processing involvement. Let's focus in on a particular chip. This particular chip does six major functions, and they're all communications related. You know, there's Wi-Fi modems for cellular connection, Bluetooth, there's the GPS, this is the HDMI connection to a you know, high-def television, and finally USB. So this single chip does all of those functions. Well, how does the, the company that create that chip know it works properly? Well, they buy our equipment. And we provide, you know, in theory, the perfect stimulus. And in theory, we can measure the result of coming out of their part without getting in the way. And so as a result, we're, again, I'm just repeating myself here, we're creating the perfect stimulus as well as the perfect receiver um, so that our customers can test their parts as well. And in essence, the way we get out of our own way to make the perfect instrument, you know, generally the, the block diagrams that go into the instruments or any of the other um, consumer products we buy are very complex, have lots of analog bits and pieces to them. But those analog bits and pieces have anomalies that need to be corrected. And that's where DSP comes into play. And it's DSP that creates those, the perfect, the perfection we're driving for. So in essence, we have a, a, a rather complex value chain. So our bag of parts, you know, the chips we design, the software code we write, and the boards we create go into instruments, our perfect instruments, which then are used by our customers to measure their bag of parts, which then go in to all the consumer products we buy and, and use, as well as communicate with. So with that as an introduction and motivation for the talk, and I did that all in eight minutes, let's talk about some of the fundamentals of DSP. And we'll cover Fourier transform sampling and Nyquist theorems here a little bit. And unfortunately, yes, there's mathematics in this talk. Um, however, the math I'm not going to go deeply into, and I'm going to be very visual about the mathematics. But one of the key um, tools in our toolbox as um, DSP engineers is the Fourier transform. And this, in, and this is simply the definition of a Fourier transform. And I, obviously, we need to be able to reverse it. So these two equations are part of the elegance I'm talking about. They're compact. They're powerful. We can use them in lots of different domains. They're also reversible and symmetric. So again, there's that elegance piece. Um, let's dive into the equation just a little bit more here and emphasize what is that thing? So that's a complex sinusoid, which uh, when expanded through Euler's formula, is essentially a cosine and a sine term with a complex number involved. However, if you look at how this thing is constructed, it's basically an infinite summation of an infinite number of sinusoids, so a single frequency sinusoids. And so every signal we generally work with can be decomposed into any number of, you know, an infinite series of sinusoids. So with that introduction, I'll throw a little more symbology in here. So in crossing domains, you'll see me using this arrow from now on. So a transformation from time to frequency and back is uh, symbolized by that symbol. Unfortunately, I, I've used photographs and copies out of a textbook, which uses two different 
um, variables. Don't get confused by that. It's still two different domain transformations, you know, whether we can consider a time and frequency or space and you know, a spatial frequency. Well, let's, let's dive in with the first one. And the simplest is a cosine wave. It's nice and symmetric. It's for a transform. It's two impulse functions, which are symbolized by these um, Greek delta characters. And an impulse function is something that has, you know, an amplitude, but is also infinitesimally thin. It only exists at one point. And in this case, it exists only at two frequencies. So a frequency, a positive frequency as well as a negative frequency. We can do the same thing with a sine wave. However, since it's asymmetric, its Fourier transform comes out to be purely complex and also has a reversal. But again, it's two, two pure tones, two single frequency sine waves, well, you know, tones that exist in the, in the frequency domain. Um, Fourier transforms are linear. So you can combine linearly, you know, various other equations and end up getting you know, you end up, you can basically combine in the 4A domain to do the summation and the, and the addition of or the multiplication by the complex, and you get a single tone. So this represents basically a complex sinusoid in, in the complex plane, which is rotating in one direction around the complex plane. If you invert the sine of the, of the complex term, you get the negative frequency term. But, and that's rotating in the opposite direction. So that's what makes up a complex sinusoid. So let's jump into convolution. Convolution is another name for filtering. And as I mentioned before, filtering we do all the time. The mathematics behind filtering, this is the convolution integral, is best explained through pictures here. So we'll take our input function, our f of x, and the function which we're going to apply against it is this g of x. Well, this equation says, take that equation, take the g of x, and flip it, and then slide it along this, this axis here, and at every point, do the integral. So basically, I've inverted the g of x, I've slid it over to a certain position x, or I've slid it along the u axis here, the, inter the, the domain of integration. and Compute the area of the integral. That is the value of our point of h of x at that particular time. So again, convolution is basically taking two, one, equ one equation, flipping it, and sliding it against the other, and constantly doing the integration. The Fourier trans, well, let's stop a second. So the symbology for that, the simplified, just having to write that all the time, is just a star symbol. Its Fourier transforms are beautiful in the sense that convolution and the Time domain or spatial domain is a multiplication in the four in the frequency domain. Well, the reverse happens. You convolve in the frequency domain means multiplication in the time domain. So again, there's that symmetry that's part of the beauty of the Fourier um, analysis. And it's also quite powerful. A particularly important aspect of convolution is this situation where you use an impulse as a stimulus. Now again, so here's our impulse. So imagine you take that impulse and just slide it through the function of interest. Well, guess what? You get your function of interest out. So that's a key part of characterizing systems, and we use that an awful lot. And I'll describe that later in a talk in a particular um, case. So we need two more pieces in our toolbox before I move on. One is domain expansion and contraction, or what's called a similarity theorem. And what that basically means, if you expand or contract, in one domain, it does the opposite in the other. So in this particular case, we have a high frequency, and those tones, those two tones we talked about before, are far apart. If we lower the frequency, as you might expect, those tones come down in frequency and, and are closer together. So that's domain expansion and contraction. Finally is modulation, which is another term for mixing or up conversion or down conversion. And all we're doing, we're taking, all we're doing is taking our function of interest and multiplying by a complex sinusoid, which in this case, as I said before, just in the slide, two slides before, multiplication in the time domain is convolution in the frequency domain. So let's take in the 
here's our Fourier transform of our f of x, and here's the our complex sinusoid is a delta or is an impulse function in, in the frequency domain. So again, just slide the impulse function through the, that f of x, and you get that the function you're interested in transmitted in frequency. So that's up conversion. So now let's dive into sampling. So the basis of sampling is basically, oops, I went too far there, is just take an infinite series of impulse functions as our sampling function. And we're going to use that and multiply it against all the functions we care about to do sampling against. One of the beauties of this function is that it's its, its own Fourier transform. So let's use it. So here is our function of interest, and it's band limited in the sense that here its Fourier transform is shown here. I'm only showing half of it. It would actually be symmetric if I had the negative axis here. But it has a cutoff frequency. It's band limited. So it goes to zero at this um, point S of C described here. So here's our sampling function. And we're using the similarity theorem to say, OK, we've, we've picked a particular um, sample rate or sample period, which translate into a, um, you know, the spacing in the 4A domain is basically all that similarity theorem I described before, the expansion contraction. So the sample period here is reflected in the inverse, and the, the spacing of these guys is the, is the inverse of the sampling period. So that's the sampling frequency, f of s. Now, if f of s is greater than twice the bandwidth of our signal, we basically, as we described before, so multiplying those two things together in the time domain is convolution to frequency domain. So again, take our function, invert it, you know, turn it around, and then slide it across the axis. So every time it hits an impulse function, it replicates. So sampling replicates in the frequency domain the signal, your signal of interest. And a key part, key thing here is that you want to sample at a high enough frequency so that these replicates are all distinct and separated from each other. If you don't do that, and you sample at too low of a frequency, you can get overlap of your spectra, and you can never recover the signal. So the overlap spectra is called aliasing, and you're unable to recover the original signal. Let's go into that a little bit more here. This bit of, so here's our original signal and its original Fourier transform. So we're going to sample that, which replicates that signal at, at every FS, at FS separation. Now to recover this signal and to perfectly reconstruct it, we actually need a perfect um, rectangle function to um, carve out that particular piece we're interested in. And in doing that is basically um, doing a um, multiplication in the frequency domain is a convolution in time domain. And the end result of that is to perfectly reconstruct our signal is basically an infinite summation of the samples against the particular function, which is the perfect interpolating function. So the, the key point here is this, this box function has to be perfect. It's perfectly flat through here, and it's a brick wall. It dives to zero immediately at this transition. So that will come into play in, as we make our perfect instruments later. In a lot of cases, obviously, we can't do that in perfection. We can only, we, we can only do summations over a limited extent to actually make it realizable and, compu and computable. So part of the design challenge for us is how do you design a filtering function which allows a limited extent summation so that it doesn't corrupt our signal too much? You know, how close of an approximation can we get to our original function? And so what happens here in this particular case, depending on how flat this area is and how much leakage from these other um, replicates are, will we'll pollute our reconstructed signal. So it's key on how we construct that particular function. Let's dive to the discrete Fourier transform for a moment. It's, um, take our continuous um, domain stuff and discretize it. So we talked earlier about 
taking a function and sampling it at some sample rate. Obviously, we get the replicants we talked about before. But now let's discretize in the frequency domain as well. And we'll do it at a delta F frequency spacing, which is related to our sample frequency. The end result of sampling in the frequency domain as well ends up giving you replicates in the time domain. So you end up having the symmetry. The DFT is basically taking a fixed range of samples that we assume are then replicated in time, even though in reality what we usually do is when we're sampling, we just take a block, take a block out of there and assume it then is then repeated. And when doing a discrete Fourier transform on it, gives us a discretized set of tones in the, four, in the frequency domain. So again, it's, it's this replication in both the frequency and time domain that we have to be very careful of when transforming before, between domains in a, in a digital sense. So again, the definitions in a discrete Fourier transform look very similar to the, um, to the continuous Fourier transforms that you described earlier. So again, the complex sinusoid and its inverse is shown here. But it's a little clear now that, you know, again, it's a, in this case, it's a, a, a finite summation of a set of tones, which then repeat themselves on and on. And actually, at this point, you know, this, the theory behind this, or this actually is used practic in, a, in a practical sense in real systems. So the 4G systems that we use that are ubiquitous now in our cellular phone communication systems, as well as the Wi-Fi and the DSL modems we use at home, all use a modulation scheme called OFDM. OFDM is, is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And let's walk through that. So all you're taking is your digital bits in, mapping them to the complex plane. So that's what this stage does. So we take every four bits, convert it into a complex number that we use as input to an inverse Fourier transform. So we do we keep doing that. So every every four digits maps into a different symbol which then maps into this complex plane. But all those x's are used as terms in that inverse Fourier DFT. And that's exactly what we modulate. So that entire equation then is built up in this inverse FFT here and is directly modulated. And the reason they do that is because each of these tones are mathematically purely independent of each other. And if one tone and being transmitted over the air sort of gets attenuated, you don't, necessarily, you don't necessarily miss that tone. There's not much information there. And actually, you can recover it a lot of times by knowing what's in all the other tones. So that's, that's in essence, just by knowing the, what a DFT does, you now know exactly you know, how most of the communication systems we live with today work. So in this particular area here. So I'm going to step back and talk a little about what we do in instruments, in particular how we calibrate them and make them perfect. And here's where we'll get a little more detail and a little more practicality. So a typical receiver is shown here. It, it has an analog RF section. It's very high frequency, typically in the gigahertz range. There's an analog IF, which we basically need to downconvert the signal we're interested in to a to a point where it actually can be converted to digital bits by the analog to digital converter. And we have to do that by getting it into a particular frequency position by down converting it and also eliminating, eliminating its bandwidth. So at that point, we have digital bits and we continue to process it through a digital intermediate frequency um, set of things. So simplistically, we have an RF section, an IF section, and then a correction block. So the idea is that this correction block is to correct the anomalies that exist in these analog bits and pieces here. And, I, and of course, ideally, it, the x we're receiving is the x we get out once we have the, correction, the proper correction in place. So 
one way of characterizing a system is through the impulse response, as I described earlier. Well, why am I using a step, res step response instead here? Well, impulses are really hard to make. And it's much easier to create steps. So it turns out mathematically that a step is related to an impulse simply through an integral or a differentiation. So once you've done a processing on a step, you can just um, take the differential, get the impulse response, and then get your frequency response. So here, for example, is a step response of a, of a typical receiver system. Unfortunately, I didn't blow it up. I didn't have time to go back and remeasure this. So there is a, there's a particular rise time and a, and a bunch of ringing that goes on in the step response. So that step response, when converted to an impulse, this, is, this again is a computed impulse response, again shows a finite width as well as ringing, which is, a character, which is characteristic of the system we just stimulated. When you convert this to the frequency domain, you end up getting the frequency characteristic of the chain we just measured. And as you can see, there's a lot of asymmetry here, and there's also lots of roll-off at the far ends of the band that we're interested in. And this is a approximately 200 megahertz wide um, bandwidth. And notice that the scale here is a 5 dB per division. So that's quite a bit of roll-off. So we need to correct this. Well, to correct it, we, we basically invert this, um, this response to get our correction that we're going to apply. So combining this correction with our system and then remeasuring, we can get an absolutely flat, within pretty tight error bars, response. You know, this is 0.1 dB per division now. So we've, we've improved things by over 100 times. And each line is at a different RF center frequency. So we've now created sort of basically a, a perfect instrument for measuring the, the signals we're bringing in to our system. We can do the same thing on a source. So a, a source is made up of a, its digital IF, an analog IF for up conversion, as well as, a, as, a, as, well as an analog RF. The, the block diagram over here is a little more complex. Um, that's just a specific block diagram for a, uh, There's another way to build sources, but this is one particular one that's difficult to characterize. So again, we need to actually now pre-distort our digital data in order to create, to replicate the signal we wanted in at the output. So rather than using steps or impulses, another way of stimulating our system is to use what I call chirps. A chirp is basically sinusoid whose frequency increases linearly with time. And if you integrate that, you end up having a phase that's quadratic in time. And it's this phase you use, it's that term which you use in a sinusoidal equation to describe a chirp signal. So here's a discrete, discretized version of a um, chirp signal. So basically it's a complex sinusoid, but because of the quadratic term, it's a chirp. Well, the fascinating thing about a chirp is that when you convert it to the frequency domain, it turns out its amplitude is constant. It has a constant magnitude. So as a result, it excites all frequencies equally. So rather than you know, stimulating our system either with an impulse or a step or even with single frequency sinusoids and stepping that thing you know, very slowly through every frequency point you're interested in, just take a chirp, do it real quick, and you excite all the frequencies you're interested in and get the result. So here's what a chirp looks like. So, and this is actually the output. So the input was a perfect chirp. The output was this, where the, at the far ends is the high frequency end of the chirp, and in the middle is the low frequency end. So it goes from high to low, back to high. And you can see that there's, of course, the frequency, you know, is rolling off at the high frequency ends. It also has, you know, if your mind's eye draws a line across there, it also has wiggles in the frequency response through, through the frequencies of which we're interested in actually making perfect. So you convert this also, well, I should step back. So what that looks like in the frequency domain, again, is a, is a set of comb teeth that are all approximately equal in amplitude. So that goes back to the 
perfect nature of a chirp. It has a constant amplitude in time domain, a constant amplitude in frequency domain. So you compute a correction filter response for that situation and apply it, and back again where you've come back to the perfection we were after. Now this is 0.05 dB per division on a source, and so again, we've improved things by over 100 approximately almost 1,000 times compared to what the raw analog system was able to do. So that's where we use DSP in our instruments. So I've gone really quickly, and so in essence, I've said, at least for us, DSP is everywhere, and I've covered situations where, you know, we do, it's in our chips, it's in our code, it's in the boards we make as a result, by combining all of that, which is, are used in the systems I described earlier, but it also crops up elsewhere. So in medical imaging, 2D Fourier transforms are heavily used. This is a CAT scanner, CT scanner. And then for even analyzing biological molecules in a nuclear magnetic resonance system. And this particular system also uses impulses and steps to, to stimulate responses of molecules. And from those responses using FFTs, or for, you know, discrete Fourier transforms, they can actually discover the structure of a molecule through um, those processes. So I leave you with a number of references. And I'm finished and ready for questions, um, if you have one. So sorry for going so fast. Oh, I went really quick. <laughs> I'm going to open up with a question. You have one of your slides, Nyquist. Um, I might have missed it. Can you say something about Nyquist? Eventually get there. Sorry for all my emissions. <clears throat> So the Nyquist reconstruction. So the Nyquist criterion is basically the fact that you need to sample at a sampling rate that's higher than the bandwidth of the signal of interest. In this case, it's you know, the bandwidth to me is you know, twice this. Um, well, it's basically this. Wherever this the frequency domain um, of the signal exists. So if I go back to um, that particular thing. So, did you have a specific question? Yeah, the, it's, the idea is using computer graphics with anti aliasing. Yes, the same sort of idea in computer graphics. Yep. How does, how does it compare to computer graphics and tangents? Well, the, the computer graphics, again, um, well, let's see. It's an anti-aliasing in, in a visual sense. So you're trying to blend pic neighboring pixels, as I recall, right? And anti-aliasing is meant to try and provide a sharper, you know, uh, resolution to what you're doing there. So in, in essence, anti-aliasing in a computer graphic sense is probably more, you're, you're actually band limiting the, the data that's being sent to the GPU before you actually um, sample it. So it's, a, it's the combination of this band limiting. If the original signal you're trying to put up on your screen actually has a long tail, say, say this in particular, this frequency, well, let's actually go to this guy. So this is sort of the case where we do have aliasing. So it's, it's this you're trying to remove. So if indeed you're at a situation where you're the mathematics you're using isn't providing a purely band-limited signal. What your anti-aliasing filtering doing and even a GPU is trying to band-limit things. And so basically it'll you know, apply a filter, a 2D filter of some sort that basically cuts off you know, the spread of this signal so it doesn't pollute its neighbors. And as a result, you can potentially get a sharper image on your screen. I, you know, that's my heuristic explanation. I'm not a computer graphics person, obviously. Could, um, could you do that by, uh, for example, raising, raising the x-axis to just sort of ignore the overlap there? Another way, yeah. Another way to do things is if you oversampled. Well, let's see. I've got to think this through a second. So the one way to spread spectra apart is to interpolate. And interpolation basically means you're going to be adding 
additional samples between the samples you currently have. Well, typically on a computer display, you don't have that freedom. Um, so if indeed you had that freedom, say the resolution you're actually operating on is less than what your com the computer graphics card you actually have driving your screen is capable of, then you could interpolate and spread your spectra apart a little bit, give you a little more wiggle room, and, and, and avoid this overlapping in the alias. That's another way of dealing with it potentially. Can you say a few words about the difference between doing these computations with a GPU and a traditional CPU? Um, so a CPU, at least the, in most CPUs we use today, a lot of our algorithms are, are not parallelized. So it's, you know, it's traditional procedural programming, sequential programming. And so those algorithms will be single-threaded by default, unless you go in specifically into your code and make it multi-threaded. Um, the GPU forces you to think in terms of multi-threaded space immediately, because it is basically a, thousands of math engines working in parallel on little bits and pieces of the entire problem. And at the end, it gives you back the entire problem. And so a GPU, you end up doing is you download not only the mathematical functions you want to operate on, but also all the data. And it does it all in parallel immediately for you. And so that's sort of the difference between, well, it's much more, it's, you know, a thousand folds, a million folds time more multi-threaded than a typical CPU. And as a result, it's very good at doing those sort of operations. For our purposes for signal processing, we have played with doing accelerating our mathematics and GPUs. And it certainly does run faster, but we always get bottlenecked by that step where you have to package up the algorithm as well as your data and shove it down to the GPU and then get the whole thing back. It's that latency that always defeats the things we want to do in a lot of cases, particularly if it's in real time. So that's why we do our own chips, our custom chips for accelerating our own algorithms. Yeah? Is it very good? Um, well, in code, we generally are, are iterative of it's a lot of loops. Um, as you saw, there's a lot of that going on, summations and a lot of loops there, four loops. Um, so that's what we do in code. In hardware, we parallelize all that. And for example, uh, a typical digital filter is made up, if it's a finite impulse response filter, is basically a tap delay line where you, you shift your, your, say it's this signal, you shift this signal into this. Each of these gets multiplied by a coefficient and then a summed an output. So you then you filtered you know, that block of data. Well, in hardware, we do that all in parallel. So there's a multiplier available for each one of those. And so a block of data comes in and we do the all the mathematics in parallel and get it out as quickly as we can. It's the only reason for doing it as hardware because for us, a lot of times we need to do it in real, everything in real time. And so that's where we have to do our, our own custom chips and do everything in parallel on those chips. Yeah. Uh, do you do a lot of, this is kind of, tank, but, uh, kind of a tangent, but do you do a lot of uh, digital to analog converting? Uh, yeah, that's, um, so in these block diagrams, I should just maybe get out of that. So particular, so there's the ADC. Okay. And on the source block diagram, I also showed DAC, a digital analog converter. So yeah, there, there are no portions of our designs. And in fact, we design our own a lot of times because we, we can't get commercial ones that are good enough for us, um, either because they don't run fast enough or they don't have cure enough bits. So a lot of times we do our own. And today, a lot of our converters also have a lot of DSP on them. Because the bandwidth, you know, we're talking giga samples per second rates now. And trying to do giga sample rates across um, PC boards is rather difficult. So we're integrating more and more digital processing in, on our own converters. And even commercial converters now come with a lot of DSP built on them. 
because I've um, I've seen a, a lot of different types of, of DAX, like like the, there's one in your iPod that just converts the digital signal to, to analog, but then there, you can buy one for like five hundred dollars that just does digital to analog conversion. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what 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 makes it so much better. Oh, yeah. So it depends. It all depends on the rate. So generally, um, so in your i in your iPod or if in, in an audio sense, we're talking. You know, you know the, the bandwidth of our hearing ideally is twenty kilohertz. And, you know, my ears don't go high that high, obviously. So you, you only generally need to sample at twice that. But generally, we do. Most people oversample a lot. So audio DACs and ADCs generally are running at a few hundred kilohertz. So at those rates, you can do, the, do them all in CMOS um, processes, which are ubiquitous because that's what our CPUs are built on. So it's very cheap to run them. And because you're running at those lower rates, you can actually make the hardware really small and do, like the other gentleman was talking, you can do a lot of things. that are You can share hardware. You know the computations are so slow that you can you have lots of time to just reuse hardware and iteratively computing a result. So in those things, that's why they're cheap. For the five hundred dollar parts we're talking about, where you're after is that you get speed, and generally the five hundred dollar parts, I don't know, the ones I'm familiar with, generally run at gigahertz rates. So we're talking, you know, what is that? Kilohertz to gigahertz. So 10 to the third to 10 to the ninth, so a million times faster. And so that requires more expensive processes, much more characterization to make sure they do their things properly, a lot more design effort. So that's why they're generally a lot more expensive. But the one, they're, they're also just used for, for listening to music. And oh, you can audio decks that are that yeah. way as well. It's, it's crazy. It, it's almost, it almost seems sort of religious that anyone would yeah. pay that they're, much. They're, there, I think, it's just the battle of bits mm -hmm. and single to noise ratio. Single to noise ratio and related things. And if you, beyond a certain point, most of us could care less. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that's the extreme fringe. And, th and one reason they're so expensive is that so few people buy them. Right. So the volumes are very low. So, guys, a little bit of history. If you went back at the end, Right? It began with audio Oscillator. audio oscillators. Slow, slow frequency audio oscillators. In 1939. And that was in slow flow through Agilent and now Keysight. And now Keysight. So, yeah, the instrumentation piece that ex now exists as, as Keysight was HP's foundation. So, HP was instrumentation all the way up to about the early 1970s when they started doing calculators. That's when they got into the computer business, and then the printer business, and that of course took off. And by the late, by the eighties, late eighties and early nineties, the instrumentation piece of HP was only five percent of HP's revenue. So that's why they spun it off as Agilent. So Agilent at that time was like what an eight billion dollar company, Well, HP at that time was an eighty billion dollar company. So we were not getting much attention from the executive staff. And so we became Agilent. And of course, Agilent has gone through its up and down. But what, not only did instrumentation, the electronic instrumentation get spun off, but also the medical instrumentation got spun off with Agilent. So that's now what's splitting in half. So what's, as of November 1st, the Agilent that will continue on is only life sciences measurement um, technology. Key side is all electronic measurement stuff. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, just one remark for the computer science students. I worked uh, several years ago on a uh, Fourier transform project uh, actually using brain, brain research. It was a lot slower than this. But um, the, the algorithms one of the algorithms, one of the guys came up with used some trig identities and actually found it faster to store a lot of trig um, results 
in a table in the table book up instead of recomputing everything each time. So there, there are a lot of uh, algorithms like that. Yeah, and that's where the fast, yeah, indeed. In fact, uh, that's how a lot of the fastest fully transformed pieces of code you buy today play exactly those games. Any other questions on this time this picture?